from him and serving him with respect and reverence are the most important. So the first 10 items were positive. Do this, do that. And the next 10 are negative. Don't do this, don't do that. And the first one is give up the company of non-devotees. This is the principle of association. Uh, you become like those who you associate with. If you associate with thieves, you become a thief. If you associate with woman hunters, you become a woman hunter. If you associate with rascals, you become a rascal. But if you associate with devotees, you become a devotee. You become purified. So one should associate with devotees at all times, not with non-devotees, or minimize. When, when it says uh, association, it means we should give them our association, but we should not accept their association. Now, what does that mean? That means we'll accept the association of non-devotees on a devotional platform. If they come to us, if they come to our program, if they come to our community, if they come to our um, satsang or our classes, and the uh, topic of discussion is some aspect of devotional service, then there's no problem. But if we go to them and the platform of association is material life, then we have a problem. <laughs> okay? So uh, devotee minimizes this association by only accepting association with non-devotees when that association is on some kind of a spiritual platform. Two. One should not instruct a person who is not desirous of accepting devotional service. That means we only preach when we have permission. Huh? After a while, you get really sensitive to this. When a person is listening, when they're willing to hear from you, then you tell them whatever they want to know about Krishna consciousness. But as soon as that space of hearing closes up, huh, you should be very sensitive to this. As soon as they are no longer willing to hear from you, that's it. You close the conversation uh, elegantly with uh, uh, sensitivity to the person's needs and you go away. Why? Because if a person hears about devotional service in a mood of protest, like... Why are you still talking to me? I, I'm done with this. I don't want to go any further. I don't have any more appetite to hear. Huh? They're under protest. Then uh, they're not going to take in whatever you tell them. It's not going to have any effect. It's, it's not going to be digested. Uh, you're wasting your time. And more than that, they'll create some offense. Oh, those rascal devotees, they were pounding on me again today. <laughs> so don't preach when, when people are not ready to listen, not ready to hear. Huh? Just uh, find a way to end the discussion and walk away. This might be very hard if your ego is identified with being a great devotee or being a great preacher. You know, oh, I can get anybody to listen to me. But... Actually, we just create trouble for ourselves because then people get the impression that we're pushy and that we're insensitive. Huh? And it's actually, it's true. If we're bound up in our own false ego, oh, I'm such a great preacher, I can get anybody to hear about Krishna, then we're actually neglecting the other person's needs and we're satisfying only our own. Well, what kind of preaching is that? That's not very compassionate. So we should be willing to look at the other person's point of view. And when they want to hear from us, we tell them all they want to know. And when they're done, they'll let us know in a subtle way. Huh? So if you follow that the first time, and you don't require them to you know, signal you again and again that, hey, the conversation's over, hint, hint, then people have a better sense of our, our being compassionate. Uh, so don't preach to people without permission. And the next one. One should not be very enthusiastic about constructing costly temples 
for monasteries because it's a huge entanglement. You have to raise money to construct it, and then you have to raise money to maintain it. You have to find people to build it, and then you have to deal with all these rascals, you know, contractors, and oh my God, what a what a headache. Uh, unfortunately, in this world, people are very gross-minded, and they only recognize a, a bona fide religion as one which has some kind of monument or some kind of temple or some kind of great building. Uh, but actually, in the Vaishnava tradition, our mood has been, let others build the temples. And we just uh, go in and preach. <laughs> Um, the Vaishnavas, especially the, the uh, Brahma Sampradaya Vaishnavas, and we belong to the Brahma Sampradaya, uh, are great writers. And uh, a writer's mentality is different from a temple builder's mentality. To build a great temple, you have to marshal so many resources, and it's basically a kind of Kshatriya engagement, or at least Vaisha engagement. And... Uh, we don't want to go there. We want to stay on the Brahminical platform and teach, explain the scriptures, write, and uh, teach students, keep up the Brahminical standards. And so uh, we don't want to get into that. Four, one should not try to read too many books. Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Charitamrita, and the books of the Goswamis, the six Goswamis of India. These are our main texts. And it's okay if we want to read some others like Mahabharata, Brihad Bhagavatamrita, and so on. But actually, they're unnecessary. Everything that we need to know is there in Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. So one should concentrate on these books. Better to be an expert in a very uh, important area of knowledge than to try to become a big, big scholar over the whole Vedic literatures. Uh, that's very time consuming. Uh, it's a big effort. And then what? <laughs> then you have this false ego that, oh, I'm such a great scholar. And you'll get entangled in all these debates and so on. And It's just, uh, it's again, it's a non-devotional kind of a thing based on false ego. Just like, I can construct this big, big temple. Oh boy, aren't I great. <laughs> or I can quote from every Purana, you know, every Upanishad. Oh, wonderful. So what? <laughs> can you chant Harinam 64 rounds a day or more? Huh? That's the real thing. Five, one should not be neglectful in ordinary dealings. You owe somebody money, you pay them on time. Huh? You say you're going to do X, do it. Don't be neglectful. Huh? Just because devotional service means that we have no more obligations in the ordinary ways of life doesn't mean that we can cheat people or uh, ignore our promises or be a rascal in other ways. Don't be a rascal. Don't be neglectful in ordinary dealings. Again, it damages our reputation, and it creates offenses for us. Six, one should not be under the spell of lamentation in loss or jubilation in gain. Hey, it's the material world. Stuff happens. Some days we have a good day. Some days we have a bad day. Uh, it doesn't mean anything necessarily. Huh? It's not necessarily Krishna trying to tell us something. It could just be the astrology that day or something like that. Don't take it personal. Don't take it serious. It's just the material world. Get over it already. Okay? Seven. One should not disrespect the demigods. Just because we don't worship the demigods doesn't mean we offend them. The demigods are also devotees, very highly qualified for their posts. Yes, occasionally they mess up, you know, but... That, that's because they're still conditioned souls. They're still into controlling the material world and stuff like that. But, you know, somebody's got to do it. And the best candidates are Krishna's devotees. So the, the, the demigods deserve respect just like a senior devotee deserves respect. 
even if they're not self-realized. That doesn't mean we disrespect them. But we don't exactly worship them, we worship Krishna directly. One should not give unnecessary trouble to any living entity. Well, that should be obvious. Uh, we don't harass anybody, we don't agitate anybody, we don't give someone a hard time just because we can. You know, that's, that's kid stuff. That's like junior high uh, nonsense. Now, one should carefully avoid the various offenses in chanting the holy name of the Lord or in worshiping the deity in the temple. We're going to go over the ten offenses to the holy name. And later on in this chapter, um, he's also going to talk about the offenses in worshiping the deity. Now, deity worship is something that we haven't gotten